Beijing is James Fong. He's the CEO of Oriental DreamWorks, the Chinese-American film production company involved in the creation of Kung Fu Panda 3. James, thanks so much for joining us. First of all, why was Kung Fu Panda 3 so successful on its opening in China? Well, you know, thank you so much, Nathan, for having me on the show. Um, so Kung Fu Panda has a very long legacy. It's a very well-beloved uh, character here in, in China. It started in 2008 with Kung Fu Panda 1, and then an amazing uh, opening uh, with Kung Fu Panda 2. So Kung Fu Panda 3 is actually a, uh, a, uh, uh, a carryover of that particular legacy. And I think what we've done for Kung Fu Panda 3 that's so unique amongst all the other Panda franchise and other animation is we've done a tremendous amount of effort. We've made a lot of investments to trying to make Kung Fu Panda 3 as uniquely Chinese as possible. And one of the things that we've done that's so amazing is we actually created two versions of the movie. One version in English with Chinese subtitles. The other one is a whole, it's a complete version of Kung Fu Panda and Mandarin right down to the lip sync and the, the, the Chinese um, uh, voice actors. Uh, the key word I heard from Kung Fu Panda 3 is authenticity. Even people who like 1 and 2 just saw a huge jump between Kung Fu Panda 1 and 2 and 3 because of what you're describing. How did this all come together? You know, what we do is uh, it's an effort where we really want to make sure the audience wins. For us, you know, both the Chinese team and the American team, we work collaboratively together trying to figure out exactly what we think the, Ch the Chinese audience would love to see. Um, you know, for example, one of the things that we've done in our studio in China is we work very closely with the, our American studio to make sure that the, all the design elements are authentic. Many of the landscape um, um, map paintings, a lot of the, the character designs, the set design pieces are all designed by our staff here in Oriental DreamWorks here in Beijing to go ahead and make sure that the authenticity of it, down to the costumes and everything, is as closely to the authenticity as possible. The other thing that we've done is we went ahead and created entirely new Chinese dialogue for the movie because we want to make sure that the audience is not just looking at a translated version mm. of the dialogue, but a real authentic uh, dialogue between the characters in Mandarin. So that's one of the things that we have uh, professed. Uh, we had director Tong Hua Tao, who is a Chinese director, as well as Ding Ding, who is a Chinese screenwriter, to do the both, to complete that particular version for us. And then with director Tong, we went ahead and were able to recruit uh, amazing Chinese talent, such as Jay Chow, Jackie Chan, Huang Lei, uh, Yang Mi, and others to go ahead and be the, 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 the character voices for Kung Fu Panda 3. Yeah, I even heard that Jackie Chan was told to keep his accented Mandarin because that added authenticity. And that there was this back and forth <laughs> about what Americans thought was Chinese, but Chinese people said, no, 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 like the ribbon dance uh, uh, with the panda. Was there, was there lots of misunderstandings from Americans when it comes to Chinese culture? You know, I, I think what I think the the uh, I don't think there's a lot of any confusion. I think if anything, the Chinese audience really love the fact that we not only look at Chinese um, um, kung fu from a uh, martial arts perspective, mm -hmm. but only also from a philosophical perspective. I think a lot of the things about the movie is it, it really espouses and it embodies a lot of the spirit or the values that's associated with Chinese martial arts and the Chinese culture. And I think that's one of the things that uh, the, the, the Chinese audiences have gravitated in, in so well to this particular movie. James, let's widen this out, because this sort of collaboration on this film, of course, is part of a pattern that we're seeing of more collaboration between China and Hollywood and vice versa. What's behind it? Well, I think a lot of it is, I, I, I can't speak for other studios, but for us, it's about um, the discovering and unmining the Chinese myth and stories. Um, I, mean, I think one of the things that um, both of our investors from DreamWorks, Jeffrey Kasenberg from DreamWorks, and Mr. Li Gong from China Media Capital, have a strong belief that there are so many stories in China that's yet to be told, and to be told in a way that can be both be appreciated by the audience in China and around the globe. That was the original cost, the original genesis, if you will, of our joint venture is to unmine all these amazing stories and then bring it to audiences 
in, on both both of the both sides of the Pacific. Uh, what, what you're saying is really interesting because Hollywood is desperate to get hold of the Chinese market. It's the biggest growing box office market in the world. They can see a lot of profit there, a huge market. But also, you're talking about Chinese stories having to be told not just Hollywood and the rest of the world. Is, is this a meeting of minds when it comes to the global media industry, especially in movies? Well, well I, I think, you know, in the last year, I think there's been a huge change, or at least visibly there's a change in the China market. Because prior to this, there's a lot of discussion about the top 10, uh, top 10 Chinese box offices tend to be Western movies. I think in the last year, that number has actually decreased. So the, the movies, for example, if you take the last 12 to 18 months, mm. um, you know, the, of the three movies that have broken the 2 billion RMB um, box office, Two of them are Chinese movies, and only one is a, a Western movie. That's Furious 7. And then the two Chinese, one is Monster Hunt, that was done in last uh, July. And you have Mermaid, that, was, that just happened uh, 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 over the Chinese New Year. I think you know, it, it goes to show that the Chinese audiences prefer, or at least in this particular context, a, a, a equal uh, appetite for Chinese content, as well as a certain um, appetite for Western content. So I what, think that changes the dynamics quite a bit. So, so James, sorry Please. to interrupt, but what does Hollywood then have to do to make sure its Chinese audiences are satisfied, like Kung Fu Panda 3, but on, a, on an increasingly uh, wider scale? I, I, think, I, think, you know, I think for Hollywood, they need to really think about what kind of movie translates without, local, without a lot of localization. For example, your action movie doesn't mm -hmm. require a lot of localization, so that may play well globally. Um, however, when you start talking about things that requires more story, um, that requires a little bit more depth than just action or special effects, then you need to make, then Hollywood really need to think about what would resonate, what story would really resonate with the Chinese audience. Um, you know, there's a lot of background that the Chinese audiences may not have that Hollywood may think they would have. So, you know, a lot of the you know, Chinese did not grow up the way the other uh, audiences did in Japan or, or in the U.S. or in, in Europe. They have a very unique uh, uh, growing experience in the 70s, 80s, and even, even in the 90s. So how would the Hollywood think about making those stories that resonate with these audiences across such a, a different cultural, and, and, uh, uh, cultural, cultural divide, in addition to be able to attract audiences that are behaviorally very different, that are in a bigger city, than they are in a smaller or rural cities. A tough market to crack, but also China trying to obviously get into the US market as well and globally. What lessons does China's film industry have to learn going forward as it continues to partner with Hollywood and beyond? I, I think there's a couple things. So number one, I think the um, Chinese filmmakers um, and Chinese studios need to understand the mechanics of how films are successful in in, especially in the United States, so the, the, big, the biggest market right now in, in the world. You know, there's a very specific script around three acts. There's a certain beliefs around character development and character arcs that's associated in the movie that's successful. So those are something that I think are, are something that fundamentally the, the, the filmmakers in China need to, need to, need to understand. And in addition, just like the uh, Hollywood trying to understand what resonates with the Chinese audience, I think it's very important that the Chinese studio, the Chinese filmmakers, also have an appreciation for the things that will work in the U.S., but that may not work in China or vice versa. They need to have a very intuitive uh, thinking around that. And that, I think, is, uh, can be uh, germane from these, a lot of these mutual collaboration that you're seeing right now between our studios in China and the U.S. and other collaborations between uh, Hollywood and, and, and China. Uh, what's behind the growth uh, in China in terms of the market? And what do you tell your American colleagues about what to look for? You know, we are seeing Chinese movie going exploding, especially among the young. Yes, yes. You know, I, I think there's a couple factors. First of all, it's just sheer numbers. So to just give you an example, like at, at the end of 2014, I haven't updated my number for 2015 yet, but in 2014, you know, the number of screens per million people in China is around 18. But in the U.S., it's around 123. In, um, uh, in, in Korea, South Korea, is around 44. So just the number of screens per capita, per millions of people, there's a tremendous amount of growth 
that's happening. And so China is adding a lot of screens uh, to, to, met, to meet that particular demand. And so I think that's definitely one of the driving factors. I think the second driving factor is the fact that there is a increase of civil disposable income around the middle class of, mm -hmm. in, you know, in, in China. China's per capita income has increasing. So people have more disposable income. They want to have a, 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 a nice Friday night or Saturday night entertainment. And what better place to go do that than go see a movie? James Fong, we look very much forward to seeing what Oriental DreamWorks has in the pipeline after the success of Kung Fu Panda 3. Thanks so much for joining us. Next, we'll speak with two film producers behind many successful Hollywood-China collaborations. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.